Hello there. Today I have a special treat for you. It is a 13th century manuscript um, called Oralinda. And I hope that you're enjoying my content. If you are, please snuggle up next to the like button. I always appreciate that. And let's get started. The Oralinda Book, from a manuscript of the 13th century. Okay, my son, you must preserve these books with body and soul. They contain the history of all our people, as well as our forefathers. Last year I saved them in the flood, as well as you and your mother. But they got wet, and therefore began to perish. In order not to lose them, I copied them on foreign paper. In case you inherit them, you must copy them likewise, and your children must do so too, so that they may never be lost. Written at Lewart in 3,449th year after Atland was submerged, that is, according to the Christian reckoning, the year 1256, Hido, surnamed Ora Delinda. Beloved successors, for the sake of our dear forefathers and our dear liberty, I entreat you a thousand times, never let the eye of a monk look on these writings. They are very insinuating, but they destroy in an underhand manner all that relates to us Frisians. In order to gain rich benefices, they conspire with foreign kings, who know that we are their greatest enemies, because we dare to speak to their people of liberty, rights, and the duties of princes. Therefore, they seek to destroy all that we derive from our forefathers, and all that is left of our old customs. Ah, my beloved ones, I have visited their courts. If Waralda permits it, we do not shew ourselves strong to resist. They will altogether exterminate us. Liko, surnamed Urga de Linda. Written at Ludwart, Anno Domini 803. The Book of Adela's Followers. Thirty years after the day on which the Volksmulder was murdered by the commander Nagi was a time of great distress. All the states that lie on the other side of the Wesser had been wrestled from us and had fallen under the power of Nagi, and it looked as if his power was to become supreme over the whole land. To avert this misfortune, a general assembly of the people was summoned was attended by all men who stood in good repute with Mogden priestesses. Then at the end of three days the whole council was in confusion and in the same position as when they came together. Thereupon Adela demanded to be heard and said, You all know that I was three years Burgmad. You know also that I was chosen for Volksmutter and that I refused to be Volksmutter because I wished to marry a Pole. But what you do not know is that I have watched everything that has happened as if I had really been your Volksmutter. I have constantly traveled about observing what was going on. By that means I have become acquainted with many things that others do not know. You said yesterday that our relatives on the other side of the Wesser were dull and cowardly. But I may tell you that the Magi has not won a single village from them by force of arms, but only by detestable deceit, and still more by the rapacity of their dukes and nobles. Freya has said we must not admit amongst us any but free people. But what have they done? They have imitated our enemies, and instead of killing their prisoners, 
or letting them go free, they have despised the Council of Freya and have made slaves of them. Because they have acted thus, Freya no cared no longer to watch over them. They robbed others of their freedom and therefore lost their own. This is well known to you, but I will tell you how they came to sink so low. The Fen women had children. These grew up with our free children. They played and gambled together in the fields and were also together by the hearth. There they learned with pleasure the loose ways of the Fens, because they were bad and new, and thus they became denationalized in spite of the efforts of their parents. When the children grew up and saw that the children of the Fens handled no weapons and scarcely worked, they took a distaste for work and became proud. The principal men and their cleverest sons made up to the wanton daughters of the Fens and their own daughters, led astray by this bad example, allowed themselves to be beguiled by the handsome young Fens in derision of their depraved fathers. When the Magi found this out, he took the handsomest of his Fens and Magyars and promised them red crows with golden horns to let themselves be taken prisoner by our people in order to spread his doctrines. His people did even more. The children disappeared and were taken away to the uplands and after they had been brought up in his pernicious doctrines were sent back. When these pretended prisoners had learned our language, they persuaded the dukes and nobles that they should become subject to the, to the Magi, that then their sons would succeed to them without having to be elected. Those who by their go good deeds had gained a piece of land in front of their house, they promised on their side should receive in addition a piece behind. Those who had got a piece before and behind should have a rondeal, complete circuit. And those who had a rondeal should have a whole freehold. If the seniors were true to Freya, when they changed their course and turned to the de degenerate sons, yesterday, there were among you those who would have called the whole people together to compel the eastern states to return to their duty. According to my humble opinion, they would have made a great mistake. Suppose that there was a very serious epidemic among the cattle. Would you run the risk of sending your own healthy cattle among the sick ones? Certainly not. Everyone must see what doing that would turn out, that doing that would turn out very badly for the whole of the cattle. Who then would be so imprudent as to send their children among a people wholly depraved? If I were to give you any advice, it would be to choose a new Volksmulder. I know that you are in a difficulty about it, because out of the 13 Burgmagden, that we still have remaining eight are candidates for the dignity, but I should pay no attention to that. Chuentia, the Bergmacht of Medizelblech, who is not a candidate, is a person of knowledge and sound sense, and quite as attached to our people and our customs as all the rest together. I should farther recommend that you should visit all the citadels and write down all the laws of Frias texts, as well as all the histories and all that is written on the walls in order that it may not be destroyed with the citadels. It stands written that every Volksmutter and every Bergmann shall have assistants and messengers, 21 maidens and seven apprentices, if I might add more, I would recommend that all the respectable girls in the towns should be taught. For I say positively, and time will show it, that if you wish to remain true children of Freya, never to be vanquished by fraud or arms, you must take care to bring up your daughters 
as true Freya's daughters. We must teach the children how great our country has been, what great men our forefathers were, how great we still are if we compare ourselves to others. We must tell them of the sea heroes, of their mighty deeds and distant voyages. All these stories must be told by the fireside and in the field, wherever it may be, in times of joy or sorrow. If you wish to impress it on the brains and the hearts of your sons, you must let it flow through your rip, the lips of your wives and your daughters. Adela's advice was followed. These are the Gravetmen under whose direction this book is composed. Apol, Adela's husband, three times sea king, Gravetmen of Ostfleiland and Linda Urin Orden. The towns Ugarda, Lindhim, and Stavia are under his care. The Saxman Storo, Sitia's husband, Gravetman over the Hugfenen and Wooden. Nine times he was chosen as Duke or Hermann, commander. The towns Buda and Managarda, Forda, are under his care. Abiello, Gialtia's husband, Gravetman over Suderflyland. He was three times Hermann, and towns Aiken, Ludeberg, and Katzberg are under his care. Enoch, Dewick's husband, Gravetman over Westflyland and Texel. He was chosen nine times for sea king. Waterberg, Medisblik, Forana, and Freiesberg are under his care. Fop Dunro, Fop Dunro's husband, Gravetman over the Seven Islands. He was five times sea king. The town of Walhalagara is under his care. This was inscribed upon the walls of Freiesberg in Texland, as well as at Stavia and Medislik. It was Freya's day, and seven times seven years had elapsed since Festa was appointed Volksmolder by the desire of Freya. The citadel of Medislik was ready, and a burgmod ma was chosen. Festa was about to light her new lamp, and when she had done so in the presence of all the people, Freya called from her watch star so that everyone could hear it. Festa, take your style and write the things that I may not speak. Festa did as she was bid. And thus we became Freya's children, and our earliest history began. And this is our earliest history. Waralda, who alone is eternal and good, made the beginning, and then commenced time Time wrought all things, even the earth. The earth bore grass, herbs, and trees, all useful, and all noxious animals. All that is good and useful she brought forth by day, and all that is bad and inju injurious by night. After the twelfth jewel feast, she brought forth three maidens, Lyda, out of fierce heat, Finda, out of strong heat, Freya, out of moderate heat. When the last came into existence, Waralda breathed his spirit upon her in order that men might be bound to him. As soon as they were full grown, they took pleasure and delight in the visions of Waralda. Hatred found its way among them. They each bore twelve sons and twelve daughters. At every jewel time, a couple. Thence come all mankind. Lyda was black, with hair curled like a lamb's. Her eyes shone like stars and shot out glances like those of a bird of prey. Lyda was acute. She could hear a snake glide and could smell a fish in the water. Lyda was strong and nimble. She could bend a large tree. 
Yet when she walked, she did not bruise a flower stalk. Lida was violent. Her voice was loud. And when she screamed in anger, every creature quailed. Wonderful Lida. She had no regard for laws. Her actions were governed by her passions. To help the weak, she would kill the strong. And when she had done it, she would weep by their bodies. Poor Lida. She turned gray by her mad behavior, and at last she died heartbroken by the wickedness of her children. Foolish children. They accused each other of their mother's death. They howled and fought like wolves. And while they did this, the birds devoured the corpse. Who can refrain from tears at such a recital? Finda was yellow, and her hair was like the mane of a horse. She could not bend a tree, but where Lida killed one lion, she killed ten. Finda was seductive. Her voice was sweeter than any bird's. Her eyes were alluring and enticing, but whoever looked upon them became her slave. Finda was unreasonable. She wrote thousands of laws, but she never obeyed one. She despised the frankness of the good and gave herself up to flatterers. That was her misfortune. Her head was too full, but her heart was too vain. She loved nobody but herself, and she wished that all should love her. False Finda, honey sweet with her words, but those who trusted them found sorrow at hand. Selfish Finda, she wished to rule everybody, and her sons were like her. They made their sisters serve them, and they slew each other for the mastery. Treacherous Finda, one wrong word would irritate her, and the cruelest deeds did not affect her. If she saw a lizard swallow a spider, she shuddered, but if she saw her children kill a Frisian, her bosom swelled with pleasure. Unfortunate Finda, she died in the bloom of her age, and the mode of her death is unknown. Hypocritical children. Her corpse was buried under a costly stone. Pompous inscriptions were written on it, and loud lamentations were heard at it. But in private, not a tear was shed. Despicable people, the laws that Finda established were written on golden tablets. But the object for which they were made was never attained. The good laws were abolished, and selfish instituted bad ones in their place. O oh, Fenda, the earth overflowed with blood, and your children were mown down like grass. Yes, Fenda, those were the fruits of your vanity. Look down from your watchstar and weep. Kraya was white, like the snow at sunrise, and the blue of her eyes vied with the rainbow beautiful Freya. Like the rays of the sun shone the locks of her hair, which were as fine as spider webs. Clever Freya, when she opened her lips, the birds ceased to sing and the leaves to quiver. Powerful Freya. At the glance of her eye, the lion lay down at her feet and the adder withheld his poison. Pure Freya. Her food was honey and her beverage was dew gathered from the cups of flowers. Sensible, Freya. The first lesson that she taught her children was self-control, and the second was the love of virtue. And when they were grown, she taught them to value liberty. For she said, without liberty, all other virtues serve to make you slaves, and to disgrace your origin. Generous Freya, she never allowed metal to be dug from the earth, for her own benefit, but when she did it, it was for the general use. Most happy Freya, like the starry host in the firmament, her children clustered around her. Wise Freya, when she had seen her children reach the seventh generation, she summoned them all to Flyland, and there gave them her text, saying, Let this be your guide, and it can never go ill with you. Exalted Freya, when she had thus spoken, the earth shook like the sea of Ralda. 
The ground of Flyland sunk beneath her feet. The air was dimmed by tears. And when they looked for their mother, she was already risen to her watching star. Then at length, thunder burst from the clouds, and the lightning wrote upon the firmament, Watch. Far-seeing Freya. The land from which she had risen was now a stream, and except her text, all that was in it was overwhelmed. Obedient children, when they came to themselves again, they made this high mound and built this citadel upon it. And on the walls they wrote the text, and that everyone should be able to find it, they called the land about it, Textland. Therefore it shall remain, as long as the earth shall be the earth. Freya's text, prosperity awaits the free. At last they shall see me again, through him only, I can recognize as free who is neither a slave to another nor to himself. This is my counsel. When in dire distress, and when mental and physical energy avail nothing, then have recourse to the spirit of Rowalda. But do not appeal to him before you have tried all other means, for I tell you beforehand, and time will prove its truth, that those who give way to discouragement sink under their burdens. To Ruralda's spirit only shall you bend the knee in gratitude, thrice full, for what you have received, for what you do receive, and for the hope of aid in time of need. You have seen how speedily I come to your assistance. Do likewise to your neighbor, but wait not for his entreaties. The suffering would curse you. My maidens would ease your name from the book, and I would regard you as a stranger. Let not your neighbor express his thanks to you on bended knee, which is only due to a world of spirit. Envy would assail you. Wisdom would ridicule you, and my maidens would accuse you of irreverence. Four things are given for your enjoyment. Air, water, land, and fire. But Ralda is the sole possessor of them. Therefore my counsel to you is, choose upright men who will fairly divide the labor and the fruits so that no man shall be exempt from work or from duty of defense. If ever it should happen that one of your people should sell his freedom, he is not of you, he is a bastard. I counsel you to expel him and his mother from the land. Repeat this to your children morning, noon, and night, till they think of it in their dreams. If any man, man shall deprive another, even his debtor, of his liberty, let him be to you as a vile slave, and I advise you to burn his body and that of his mother in an open place, and bury them fifty feet below the ground, so that no grass shall grow upon them. It would poison your cattle. Meddle not with the people of Lida, nor of Fenda, because Waralda would help them. And any injury that you inflicted on them would recoil upon your own heads. If it should happen that they cross, that they come to you for advice or assistance, then it behooves you to help them. But if they should rob you, then fall upon them with fire and sword. If any of them should seek a daughter of yours to wife, and she is willing, Explain to her her folly, but if she will follow her lover, let her go in peace. If your son wishes for a daughter of theirs, do the same as to your daughter. But let not either one or the other ever return among you, for they would introduce foreign morals and customs, and if these were accepted by you, I could no longer watch over you. 
upon my servant Fasta I have placed all my hopes. Therefore you must choose her for Eremogor. Follow my advice, then she will hereafter remain my servant as well as all the sacred maidens who succeed her. Then shall the lamp, which I have lighted for you, never be extinguished. Its brightness shall always illuminate your intellect, and you shall always remain as free from foreign domination as your fresh river water is distinct from the salt sea. I will stop here for now, um, but this will be a uh, this will be continued until I've completed the entire manuscript reading. If you're enjoying it, please click like, um, hug the like button for me, make a comment um, if you have any questions, and uh, hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much. Hello. Welcome back for the second part of Oralinda, the manuscript, Frisian manuscript from the 13th century. If you have not listened to the first part, go find that one. I'll put a link to it in the description as well. Um, and please give the like button a great big hug for me. Here we go. This has Fasta spoken. All the regulations which have existed a century, that is a hundred years, made by the advice of the Eremoder, with the consent of the community, be inscribed upon the walls of the citadel. And when inscribed on the walls of the citadel, they become laws and it is our duty to respect them all. If by force or necessity any regulations should be imposed upon us at variance with our laws and customs, we must submit. But should we be released, we must always return to our own again. That is Freya's will, and must be that of all her children. Fasta said, Anything that any man commences, whatever it may be, on the day appointed for Freya's worship, shall eternally fail. For time has proved that she was right, and it has become a law that no man shall, except from absolute necessity, keep that day otherwise than as a joy joyful feast. These are the laws established for the government of the citadels. Whenever a citadel is built, the lamp belonging to it must be lighted at the original lamp in Texlin, and that can only be done by the mother. Every mother shall appoint her own maidens. She may even choose those who are mothers in other towns. The mother of Texlin may appoint her own successor, but should she die without having done so, election shall take place at a general assembly of the whole nation. The mother of Texlin may have 21 maidens and seven assistants, so that there may always be seven to attend the lamp day and night. She may have the same number of maidens who are mothers in other towns. If a maiden wishes to marry, she must announce it to the mother and immediately resign her office before her passion shall have polluted the light. For the service of the mother and of each of the burked maidens, there shall be appointed 21 townsmen, seven civilians of mature years, seven warriors of mature years, and seven seamen of mature years. Out of the seven, three shall retire every year and shall not be replaced by members of their own family nearer than the fourth degree. Each may have 300 young townsmen as defenders. For this service, they must study Freya's text and the laws. From the sages, they must learn wisdom. From the warriors, the art of war. And from the sea kings, the skill required for distant voyages. 
Every year, one hundred of the defenders shall return to their homes, and those that may have been wounded shall remain in the citadels. At the election of the defenders, no burgher or gewetman or other persons of distinction shall vote, but only the people. The mother at Texlin shall have three times seven active messengers and three times twelve speedy horses. In other citadels, each maiden shall have three messengers and seven horses. Every citadel shall have fifty agriculturalists chosen by the people, but only those may be chosen who are not strong enough to go to war or to go to sea. Every citadel must provide for its own sustenance and must maintain its own defenses and look after its share of the general contributions. If a man is chosen to fill any office, refuses to serve, he can never become a burgher nor have any vote. If he is already a burgher, he shall cease to be so. If any man wishes to consult the mother or burked maid, he must apply to the secretary who will take him to the Burkmaster. He will then be examined by a surgeon to see if he is in good health. If he is passed, he shall lay aside his arms and seven warriors shall present him to the mother. If the affair concerns only one district, he must bring forward not less than three witnesses. But if it affects the whole of Friesland, he must have 21 additional witnesses in order to guard against any deceptions. Under all circumstances, the mother must take care that her children, that is, Freya's people, shall remain as temperate as possible. This is her most important duty, and it is the duty of all of us to help her in performing it. If she is called upon to decide any judicial question between the Gravetman and the community, she must incline, incline towards the side of the community in order to maintain peace, and because it is better that one man should suffer than many. If any one comes to the mother for advice and she is prepared to give it, she must do it immediately. If she does not know what to advise, she must remain waiting seven days, and if she is unable to advise, he must go away without complaining, for it is better to have no advice at all than to have bad advice. If a mother shall have given bad advice out of ill will, she must be killed or driven out of the land, deprived of everything. If her Berg Thurin are accomplices, they are to be treated in a similar manner. If her guilt is doubtful or only suspected, it must be considered and debated, if necessary, for 21 weeks. If half the votes are against her, she must be declared innocent. If two-thirds are against her, she must wait a whole year. If the votes are then the same, she must be considered guilty, but may not be put to death. If any of the one-third who have voted for her wish to go away with her, they may depart with all their live and dead stock, and shall not be the less considered, since the majority may be wrong as well as the minority. Universal Law All freeborn men are equal, wherefore they must all have equal rights on sea and land, and on all that Rada has given. Every man may seek the wife of his choice, and every woman may bestow her hand on him whom she loves. When a man takes a wife, a house, and yard must be given to him. If there is none, one must be built for him. If he has taken a wife in another village and wishes to remain, they must give him a house there, and likewise the free use of the common. To every man must be given a piece of land behind his house. No man shall have land in front of his house, still less an enclosure, unless he has performed some public service. 
In such a case it may be given, and the youngest son may inherit it, but after him it returns to the community. Every village shall possess a common for the general good, and the chief of the village shall take care that it is kept in good order, so that posterity shall find it uninjured. Every village shall have a marketplace. All the rest of the land shall be for tillage and forest. No one shall fell trees without the consent of the community or without the knowledge of the forester. For the forests are general property and no man can appropriate them. The market charges shall not exceed one twelfth of the value of the goods, either to natives or strangers. The portion taken for the charges shall not be sold before the other goods. All the market receipts must be divided yearly into a hundred parts three days before the jewel day. The gravetman and his council shall take twenty parts, the keeper of the market ten, and his assistants five, the Volksmulder one, the midwife four, the village ten, and the poor and infirm shall have fifty parts. There shall be no usurers in the market. If anyone should come, it will be the duty of the maidens to make it known through the whole land in order that such people may not be chosen for any office because they are hard-hearted. For the sake of money, they would betray everybody. The people, the mother, their nearest relations, and even their own selves. If any man should attempt to sell diseased cattle or damaged goods for sound, the market keeper shall expel him, and the maidens shall proclaim him through the country. In early times, almost all the Fens lived together in their native land, which was called Aldland, and is now submerged. They were thus far away, and we had no wars. When they were driven hitherwards, and appeared as robbers, then arose the necessity of defending ourselves. And we had armies, kings, and wars. For all this, there were established regulations, and out of the regulations came fixed laws. Here follow the laws, which were thus established. Every Frisian must resist the assailants with such weapons as he can procure, invent, and use. When a boy is twelve years old, he must devote one day in seven to learning how to use his weapons. As soon as he is perfect in the use of them, they are to be given to him, and he is to be admitted as a warrior. After serving as a warrior three years, he may become a citizen, and may have a vote in the election of the headman. When he has been seven years a voter, he then may have a vote for the chief or king, and may be himself elected. Every year he must be re-elected. Except the king, all other officials are re-eligible who act according to Freya's law. No king may be in office more than three years, in order that the office may not be permanent. After an interval of seven years, he may be elected again. If the king is killed by the enemy, his nearest relative may be a candidate to su succeed him. If he dies a natural death, or if his period of service has expired, he shall not be succeeded by any blood relation nearer than the fourth degree. Those who fight with arms are not men of counsel, therefore no king must bear arms. His wisdom must be his weapon, and the love of his warriors his shield. These are the rights of the mothers and kings. If war breaks out, the mother sends her messengers to the king, who sends messengers to the gravetmen, who call the citizens to arms. The gravetmen call all the citizens together and decide how many men shall be sent. All the resolutions must immediately be sent to the mother by messengers and witnesses. The mother considers all the resolutions and decides upon them. 
and with this the king as well as the people must be satisfied. When in the field, the king consults only his superior officers, but three citizens of the mother must be present without any voice. These citizens must send daily reports to the mother, that they may be sure nothing is done contrary to the counsels of Freya. If the king wishes to do anything which his council opposes, he may not persist in it. If an enemy appears unexpectedly, then the king's orders must be obeyed. If the king is not present, the next to him takes command, and so on in succession according to rank. If there is no leader present, one must be chosen. If there is no time to choose, anyone may come forward who feels himself capable of leading. If a king has concert, conquered a dangerous enemy, his successors may take his name after their own. The king may, if he wishes, choose an open piece of ground for a house and ground. The ground shall be enclosed and may be so large that there shall be 700 steps to the boundary in all directions from the house. His youngest son may inherit this, and that son's youngest son after him. Then it shall return to the community. They, here are the rules established for the security of all Frisians. Whenever new laws are made or new regulations established, they must be for the common good and not for individual advantage. Whenever in time of war, either ships or houses are destroyed, either by the enemy or as a matter of precaution, a general levy shall be assessed on the people to make it good again, so that no one may neglect the general welfare to pre pre preserve his own interest. At the conclusion of a war, if any men are so severely wounded as to be unable to work, they shall be maintained at the public expense and shall have the best seats at festivals in order that the young may learn to honor them. If there are windows, widows and orphans, they shall likewise be maintained at the public expense and the sons may inscribe the names of their fathers on their shields for the honor of their families. If any who have been taken prisoners should return, they must be kept separate from the camp because they may have obtained their liberty by making treacherous promises, and thus they may avoid keeping their promises without forfeiting their honor. If any enemies be taken prisoners, they must be sent to the interior of the country that they may learn our free customs. If they are afterwards set free, it must be done with kindness by the maidens, in order that we may make them comrades and friends instead of haters and enemies. From Minnow's Writings If anyone should be so wicked as to commit robbery, murder, arson, rape, or any other crime upon a neighboring state, and our people wish to inflict punishment, the culprit shall be put to death in the presence of the offended, in order that no war may arise, and the innocent suffer for the guilty. If the offended will spare his life and forego their revenge, it may be permitted. If the culprit should be a king, gravetman, or other person in authority, we must make good his fault, but he must be punished. If he bears on his shield the honorable name of his forefathers, his kinsmen shall no longer wear it, in order that every man may look after the conduct of his relatives. Laws for the Navigators Navigator is the title of those who make foreign voyages. All Freya's sons have equal rights, and every stalwart youth may offer himself as a navigator to the older man who may not refuse him as long as there is any vacancy. The navigators may choose their own masters. The traders must be chosen and named by the community to which they belong, and the navigators have no voice in their election. 
If during a voyage it is found that the king is bad or incompetent, another may be put in his place, and on the return home he may make his complaint to the alderman. If the fleet returns with profits, the sailors may divide one-third among themselves in the following manner. The king twelve portions, the admiral seven, the boatswains each two portions, the captains three, and the rest of the crew each one part, the youngest boys each one-third of a portion, the second boys half a portion each, the eldest boys two-thirds of a portion each. If any have been disabled, they must be maintained at the public expense, and honored in the same way as the soldiers. If any have died on the voyage, their nearest relatives inherit their portion. The widows and orphans must be maintained at the public expense, and if they were killed in a sea fight, their sons may bear the names of their fathers on their shields. If a top sailman is lost, his heirs shall receive a whole portion. If he was betrothed, his bride may claim seven portions in order to erect a monument to her bridegroom, and then she must remain a widow all her life. If the community is fitting out a fleet, the purveyors must provide the best provisions for the voyage and for the women and children. If a sailor is worn out and poor and has no house or patrimony, one must be given him. If he does not wish for a house, his friends may take him home, and the community must bear the expense unless his friends decline to receive it. Useful Extracts from the writings left by Mino. Mino was an ancient sea king. He was a seer and a philosopher, and he gave laws to the Cretans. He was born at Lindaord, and after all his wanderings, he had the happiness to die at Lindahem. If our neighbors have a piece of land or water, which it would be advantageous for us to possess, it is proper that we should offer to buy it. If they refuse to sell it, we must let them keep it. This is Freya's text, and it would be unjust to act contrary to it. If any of our neighbors quarrel and fight about any matter except land, and they request us to arbitrate, our best course will be to decline. But if they insist upon it, it must be done honorably and justly. If anyone comes and says, I am at war, you must help me. Or another comes and says, my son is an infant and incompetent, and I am old, so I wish you to be his guardian and to take charge of my property until he is of age. It is proper to refuse in order that we may not come into disputes about matters foreign to our free customs. Whenever a foreign trader comes to the open markets at Waringen or Almaland, if he cheats, he must immediately be fined, and it must be published by the maidens throughout the whole country. If he should come back, no one must deal with him. He must return as he came. Whenever traders are chosen to go to trading stations or to sail with the fleets, they must be well known and of good reputation with the maidens. If, however, a bad man should by chance be chosen and should try to cheat, the others are bound to remove him. If he should have committed a cheat, it must be made good and the culprit must be banished from the land in order that our name may be everywhere held in honor. If we should be ill-treated in a foreign market, whether distant or near, we must immediately attack them. For though we desire to be at peace, we must not let our neighbors underrate us or think that we are afraid. In my youth, I often grumbled at the strictness of the laws, but afterwards I learned to thank Raya for her texts and our forefathers for the laws which they established upon it. Waralda or Alvedar has given me many years, and I have tra traveled over many lands and seas, and after all that I have seen, 
I am convinced that we alone are chosen by all of Atta to have laws. Lida's people can neither make laws nor obey them. They are too stupid and uncivilized. Many are like Finda. They are clever enough, but they are too rapacious, haughty, false, immoral, and bloodthirsty. The toad blows himself out, but he can only crawl. The frog cries work, work, but he can do nothing but hop and make himself ridiculous. The raven cries spare, spare, but he steals and wastes everything that he gets into his beak. Fenda's people are just like these. They say a great deal about making good laws, and everyone wishes to make regulations against misconduct, but does not wish to submit to them himself. Whoever is the most crafty crows over the others and tries to make them submit to him, till another comes who drives him off his perch. The word Eva is too scared, sacred, for common use, therefore men have learned to say even. Eva means the sentiment which is implanted in the breast of every man in order that he may know what is right and what is wrong, and by which he is able to judge his own deeds and those of others, that is, if he has been well and properly brought up. Eva has also another meaning, that is, tranquil, smooth, like water that is not stirred by a breath of wind. If the water is disturbed, it becomes troubled, uneven, but it always has a tendency to return its tranquil condition. That is its nature, just as the inclination towards justice and freedom in, exists in Freya's children. We derive this disposition from the spirit of our father, Ralda, which speaks strongly in Freya's children and will eternally remain so. Eternity is another symbol of Ralda, who remains always just and unchangeable. <coughs> Eternal and unalterable are the signs, wisdom, and rectitude, which must be sought after by all pious people and must be possessed by all judges. If, therefore, it is desired to make laws and regulations which shall be permanent, they must be equal for all men. The judges must pronounce their decisions according to these laws. If any crime is committed respecting which no law has been made, the general assembly of the people shall be called, where judgment shall be pronounced in accordance with the inspiration of Ralda's spirit. If we act thus, our judgment will never fail to be right. If instead of doing right, men will commit wrong, there will arise quarrels and differences among people and states. Thence arise civil wars, and everything is thrown into confusion and destroyed. And, O oh, foolish people, while you are injuring each other, the spiteful Fenda's people, with their false priests, come and attack your ports. Ravish your daughters, corrupt your morals, and at last throw the bonds of slavery over every free man's neck. And we will stop there for this recording. Looks like there's probably going to be four parts to this. Give me a like, uh, share the channel, make me a comment, tell me how you think. Um, what you think and it was good to see you again i hope that you come back soon thank you have a good night hello we're continuing on with our reading of the orlinda the 13th century manuscript i'll start where we left off please kick me down a like um, or make a comment Share the channel if you have friends that you think would like it. All those things help me a lot. So let's get started. From Minnow's writings. When Nalhenia 
whose real name was Minerva, was well established, and the Kirklanders loved her as well as our own people did, there came some princes and priests to her citadel and asked Minerva where her possessions lay. Helenia answered, I carry my possessions in my own bosom. What I have inherited is the love of wisdom, justice, and freedom. If I lose these, I shall become as the least of your slaves. Now I give advice for nothing, and then I should sell it. The gentleman went away laughing and saying, Your humble servants, wise Helenia. But they missed their object, for the people took up this name as a name of honor. When they saw that their shot had missed, they begun, began to illuminate with her and to say that she had bewitched the people but our people and the good Kirkalanders understood at once that it was calumny. she was once asked if you are not a witch what is the use of the eggs that you always carry with you Minerva answered these eggs are the symbols of Freya's councils in which our future than that of the whole human race lies. Time will hatch them, and we must watch that no harm happens to them. The priest said, well answered, but what is the use of the dog on your right hand? Helenia replied, does not the shepherd have a sheep dog to keep his flock together? What the dog is to the shepherd, I am in Freya's service. I must watch over Freya's flock. We understand that very well, said the priests. But tell us, what means the owl that always sits upon your head? Is that light shunning animal a sign of your clear vision? No, answered Helenia. He reminds me that there are people on earth who like him have their homes in churches and homes, who go about in the twilight, not like him, to deliver us from mice and other plagues, but to invent tricks to steal away the knowledge of other people in order to take advantage of them, to make slaves of them, and to suck their blood like leeches. Another time they came with a whole troop of people when the plague was in the country and said, we are all making offerings to the gods that they may take away the plague. Will you not help to turn away their anger, or have you yourself brought the plague into the land with all your arts? No, said Minerva. I know no gods that do evil, therefore I cannot ask them to do better. I only know one good spirit, that is Waralda's, and as he is good, he never does evil. Where then does evil come from? asked the priests. All the evil comes from you and from the stupidity of the people who let themselves be deceived by you. If then your God is so exceedingly good, why does he not turn away the bad? asked the priests. Helenia answered, Freya has placed us here, and the carrier that is, time, must do the rest. For all calamities there is counsel and remedy to be found. But Heralda wills that we should search it out ourselves, in order that we may become strong and wise. If we will not do that, he leaves us to our own devices, in order that we may experience the results of wise or foolish conduct. Then a prince said, I should think it best to submit. Very possibly, answered Helenia, for then men would be like sheep, and you and the priests would take care of them, shearing them and leading them to shambles. This is what our God, God does not desire. He desires that we should help one another, but that all should be free and wise. That is also our desire, and therefore our people choose their princes, counts, conciliars, chiefs, and masters among the wisest of the good men. 
in order that every man shall do his best to be wise and good. Thus doing, we learn ourselves and teach the people that being wise and acting wisely can alone lead to holiness. That seems very good judgment, said the priests. But if you mean that the plague is caused by our stupidity, then Nihelenia will perhaps be so good as to bestow upon us a little of that new light of which she is so proud. Yes, Helenia said, but ravens and other birds of prey feed only on dead carrion, whereas the plague feeds not only on carrion, but on bad laws and customs and wicked passions. If you wish the plague to depart from you and not return, you must put away your bad passions and become pure within and without. We admit that the advice is good, said the priests, but how shall we induce all the people under our rule to agree to it? Then Helenia stood up and said, the sparrows follow the sower. The people, their good princes, therefore, it becomes you to begin by rendering yourselves pure, so that you may look within and without and not be ashamed of your own conduct. Now instead of purifying the people, you have invented foul festivals in which they have so long reveled that they wallow like swine in the mire to atone for your evil passions. The people began to mock and to jeer, so that she did not dare pursue the subject, and one would have thought that they would have called all the people together to drive us out of the land, but no one, in place of abusing her, they went all about from the heathenish Kirkland to the Alps, proclaiming that it had pleased the Almighty God to send his clever daughter Minerva surnamed Nihelenia, over the sea in a cloud to give people good counsel, and that all who listened to her should become rich and happy, and in the end, governors of all the kingdoms of the earth. They erected statues to her on all their altars. They announced and sold to the simple people advice that she had never given and related miracles that she had never performed. They cunningly made themselves masters of our laws and customs, and by craft and such subtlety were able to explain and spread them around. They appointed priestesses under their own care, who were apparently under the protection of Festa, our first era modra, to watch over the holy lamp but the lamp they lit themselves, and instead of imbuing the priestesses with wisdom, and then sending them to watch the sick and educate the young, they made them stupid and ignorant, and never allowed them to come out. They were employed as advisors, but the advice which seemed to come from them was but the repetition of the behests of the priests. When Nihelenia died, we wished to choose another mother, and some of us wished to go to Texland to look for her. But the priests, who were all powerful among their own people, would not permit it, and accused us before the people of being unholy. From the writings of Minnow. When I came away from Athenia with my followers, we arrived at an island named by my crew, Creta. Because of the cries that the inhabitants raised on our arrival. When they really saw that we did not come to make war, they were quiet, so that at last I was able to buy a harbor in exchange for a boat and some iron implements and a piece of land. When we had been settled there a short time and they discovered that we had no slaves, they were very much astonished. And when I explained to them, that we had laws which made everybody equal, they wished to have the same. But they had hardly established them before the whole land was in confusion. The priests and the princes declared that we had excited their subjects to rebellion, 
and the people appealed to us for aid and protection. When the princes saw that they were about to lose their kingdom, they gave freedom to their people and came to me to establish a code of laws. The people, however, got no freedom and the princes remained masters, acting according to their own pleasure. When this storm had passed, they began to sow divisions among us. They told my people that I had invoked their assistance to make myself permanent king. Once I found poison in my food. So when a ship from Flyland sailed past, I quietly took my departure. Leaving alone and then my own adventures, I will conclude this history by saying that we must not have anything to do with Venda's people, wherever it may be, because they are full of false tricks, fully as much to be feared as their sweet wine with deadly poison. Here ends Minnow's writing. These are the three principles on which these laws are founded. One, everybody knows that he requires the necessaries of life, and if he cannot obtain them, he does not know how to preserve his life. Two, all men have a natural desire to have children, and if it is not satisfied, they are not aware what evil may spring from it. Three, every man knows that he wishes to live free and undisturbed and that others wish the same thing. To secure this, these laws and regulations are made. The people of Fenda have also their rules and regulations, but these are not made according to what is just, only for the advantages of priests and princes. Therefore, their states are full of disputes and murder. One, if any man falls into a state of destitution, his case must be brought before the count by the maidens, because a high-minded Frisian cannot bear to do that himself. Two, if any man becomes poor because he will not work, he must be sent out of the country, because the cowardly and lazy are troublesome and ill-disposed. Therefore, they ought to be got rid of. Three, every young man ought to seek a bride and to be married, at five and twenty. Four. If a young man is not married at five and twenty, he must be driven from his home, and the younger men must avoid him. If then he will not marry, he must be declared dead and leave the country so that he may not give offense. Five. If a man is impotent, he must openly declare that no one has anything to fear from him then he may come and go where he likes. Six, if after, he, after that he commits any act of incontinence, then he must flee away. If he does not, he may be given over to the vengeance of those whom he has offended, and no one may aid him. Seven, anyone who commits a theft shall restore it threefold. For a second offense, he shall be sent to the ten mines. The person robbed may forgive him if he pleases, but for the third offense, no one shall protect him. These rules are made for angry people. One, if a man in a passion or out of ill will breaks another's limb or puts out an eye or a tooth, he must pay whatever the injured man demands. If he cannot pay, he must suffer the same injury as he has done to the other. If he refuses this, he must appeal to the Berchtmod in order to be sent to work in the iron or tin mines until he has expiated his crime under the general law. Two, if a man is so wicked as to kill a Frisian, he must forfeit his own life. But if the Berchtmod can send him to the tin mines for his life before he is taken, she may do so. Three, the prisoner can prove by proper witnesses that the death was accidental. He may go free, but if it happens a second time, 
he must go to the tin mines in order to avoid any unseemly hatred or vengeance. These rules are the rules concerning bastards. 1. If any man sets fire to another man's house, he is no Frisian, he is a bastard. If he is caught in the act, he must be thrown into the fire, and wherever he may flee, he shall never be secure from the avenging justice. 2. No true Frisian shall speak ill of the faults of his neighbors. If any man injures himself, but does no harm to others, he must be his own judge. But if he becomes so bad that he is dangerous to others, they must bring it before the court. But if instead of going to the court, a man accuses another behind his back, he must be put on the pillory in the marketplace, and then sent out of the country, but not to the tin mines, because even there a backbiter is to be feared. 3. If any man should prove a traitor, and show to our enemies the paths leading to our places of refuge, or creep into them by night, he must be the offspring of Finda. He must be burnt. The sailors must take his mother and all his relations to a desolate island, and there scatter his ashes, in order that no poisonous herbs may spring from them. The maidens must curse his, his name in all the states, in order that no child may be called by his name, and that his ancestors may repudiate him. War had come to an end, but famine came in its place. There were three men who each stole a sack of corn from different owners, but they were all caught. The first owner brought this thief to the judge, and the maiden said everywhere that he had done right. The second owner took the corn away from the, his thief and let him go in peace. The maiden said he has done well. The third owner went to the thief's house, and when he saw what misery was there, he went and brought a wagon load of necessaries to relieve their distress. Freya's maidens came around him and wrote his deed in the eternal book and wiped out all his sins. This was reported to the Ermo Modr, and she had it made known over the whole country. What appears at the top of the signs of the jewel, that is, the first symbol of Ralda, also of the origin or beginning from which time is derived, this is the Kroder, which must always go round with the jewel. According to this model, Freya formed the set hand, which she used to write her texts. When Fasta was Ermolder, she made a running hand out of it. The Witkoning, that is, the Sea King Godfried, the Old, made separate numbers for the set hand and for the runic hand. It is therefore not too much that we celebrate it once a year. We may be eternally thankful to Rolda that he allowed his spirit to exercise such an influence over our forefathers. In her time, Vinda also invented a mode of writing, but that was so high flown and full of flourishes that her descendants have soon lost the meaning of it. Afterwards, they learned our writing, that is the Fens and Thryris and Krokolanders, but they did not know that it was taken from the jewel, and most therefore always be must, therefore always be written round like the sun. Furthermore, they wished that their writing should be illegible by other people because they always had matters to conceal. In doing this, they acted very unwisely because their children could only with great difficulty read the writings of their predecessors, whereas our most ancient writings are as easy to read as those that were written yesterday. This stands inscribed upon all citadels. Before the bad time came our country, was the most beautiful in the world. 
The sun rose higher, and there was seldom frost. The trees and shrubs produced various fruits, which are now lost. In the fields we had not only barley, oats, and rye, but wheat, which shone like gold, and which could be baked in the sun's rays. The years were not counted, for one was as happy as another. On one side we were bounded by Vuralda's sea, on which no one but us might or could sail. On the other side we were hedged in by a broad Twixland, through which the Fenda people dared not come on account of the thick forests and wild beasts. Eastward our boundary went to the extrem extremity of the East Sea and westward to the Mediterranean Sea, so that besides the small rivers we had twelve large rivers given us by Hualda to keep our land moist and to show our seafaring men the way to the sea. The banks of these rivers were at one time entirely inhabited by our people as well as the banks of the Rhine from one end to the other opposite Denmark and Jutland, we had colonies and the Bergmog. Thence we obtained copper and iron as well as tar and pitch and some other necessaries. Opposite to us we had Britain, formerly Westland, with her ten mines. Britain was the land of the exiles, who with the help of their Bergmog had gone away to save their lives. But in order that they might not come back, they were tattooed with a bee on the forehead and banished with a red dye. The other crimin criminals were blue. Moreover, our sailors and merchants had many factories among the distant Krekelanders and in Lydia. In Lydia, Libya, the people are black. As our country was so great and extensive, we had many different names. Those who were settled to the east of Denmark were called Jutan, because often they did nothing else other than look for amber, Jutan, on the shore. Those who lived in the islands were called Letan, because they lived an isolated life. All those who lived between Denmark and Sandval, now the Scheldt, were called Sturleiden, pilots. Sea campers, naval men, and Angleran, fishermen. The Angleran were men who fished in the sea, and were so named because they used lines and hooks instead of nets. From there to the nearest parts of Kirkelanden, the inhabitants were called Kadhemers, because they never went to sea but remained ashore. Those who were settled in the higher marches, bound by Twixland, Twixlanden, Germany, were called Saxmannen, because they were always armed against the wild beasts and the savage Britons. Besides these, we had the names Lanzaten, natives of the land, Marzaten, natives of the fens, and Wood, or Hutzaten, natives of the woods. How the bad time came. During the whole summer, the sun had been hid behind the clouds, as if unwilling to look upon the earth. There was perpetual calm, and the damp mist hung like a wet sail over the houses and the marshes. The air was heavy and oppressive, and in men's hearts was neither joy nor cheerfulness. In the midst of this stillness, the earth began to tremble as if she was dying. The mountains opened to vomit forth fire and flames. Some sank into the bosom of the earth, and in other places mountains rose out of the plain. Odland, called by the seafaring people Utland, disappeared, and the wild waves rose so high over hill and dale that everything was buried in the sea. Many people were swallowed up by the earth, and others who had escaped the fire perished in the water. It was not only in Finda's land that the earth vomited fire, but also in Twiskland, Germany. Whole forests were burned one after the other, 
and when the wind blew from that quarter, our land was covered with ashes. Rivers changed their course, and at their mouths, new islands were formed of sand and drift. During three years, this continued, but at length it ceased and forests became visible. Many countries were submerged, and in other places land rose above the sea, and the wood was destroyed through the half of Twi Twiskland, Germany. Troops of Finda's people came and settled in the empty places. Our dispersed people were exterminated or made slaves. Then watchfulness was doubly impressed upon us, and time taught us that union is force. This is inscribed on a Wara Burgat by Alda Gamud. The Wara Burgat is not a maiden city, but the place where all the foreign articles brought by sailors were stored. It lies three hours south from Medibis, Medisblik. Thus is the preface. Hills, bow your heads. Weep, ye streams and clouds. Yes, Schoenland, Scandinavia, blushes. An enslaved people tramples on your garment, O Freya. This is the history. One hundred and one years after the submersion of Alda Aland, a people came out of the east. That people was driven by another. Behind us in Tuskland, Germany, they fell into disputes divided into two parties, and each went its own way. Of the one no account has come to us, but the other came in the back of our Schoenland, which was thinly inhabited, particularly the upper part. Therefore they were able to take possession of it without contest, and as they did no other harm, we would not make war about it. Now that we have learned to know them, we will describe their customs, and after that, how matters went between us. They were not wild people, like most of Finda's race, but like the Egyptians, they have priests and also statues in their churches. The priests are the only rulers. They call themselves Magyars, and their headman Magi. He is a high priest and king in one. The rest of the people are of no account and in subjection to them. This people have not even a name, but we call them Finns, because although all the festivals are melancholy and bloody, they are so formal that we are inferior to them in that respect. But still they are not to be envied, because they are slaves to their priests and still more to their creeds. They believe that evil spirits abound everywhere and enter into men and beasts, but of Waralda's spirit they know nothing. They have weapons of stone, the Magyars of copper. The Magyars affirm that they can exercise and recall the evil spirits, and this frightens the people so that you never see a cheerful face. When they were well established, the Magyars sought our friendship. They praised our language and customs, our cattle and iron weapons, which they would willingly have exchanged for their gold and silver ornaments. And they always kept their people within their own boundaries, and that outwitted our watchfulness. Eight years afterwards, just at the time of Jewel, jewel Feast, they overran our country like a snowstorm driven by the wind. All who could not flee were killed. Freya was appealed to, but the Schoenlanders, Scandinavians, had neglected her advice. Then all the forces were assembled, and three hours from Godesburgt, they were withstood, but war continued. Kat or Catherine was the name of the priestess who was the Bergmacht of Godesburgt. She was proud and haughty, and would neither seek counsel nor aid from the mother. But when the Bergtherian citizens knew this, they themselves sent messengers to Texland, to the Ermolder. Mina, this was the name of the mother, summoned all the sailors and the young men of Ufsvleiland and Denmark. 
from this expedition the history of Woden Spring, which is inscribed on the citadels and is here copied. At Aldergamud there lived an old sea king whose name was Thierik, and whose deeds were famous. This old fellow had three nephews. Woden, the eldest, lived at Lumkamakia, near Emmud and Ustflyland with his parents. He had once commanded troops. Tiunis and Inca were naval warriors and were just then saying with their father at Aldergamud. <coughs> when the young warriors had assembled together, they chose Woden to be their leader or king. And the naval force chose Tiunis for their sea king and Inca for their admiral. The navy then sailed to Denmark, where they took on board Woden and his valiant host. The wind was fair, so they arrived immediately in Schumund. When the northern border borders met together, Woden divided his powerful army into three bodies. Freya was their war cry, and they drove back the Finns and Magyars like children. When the Magi heard how his forces had been utterly defeated, he sent messengers with truncheon and crown, who said to Woden, O oh, almighty king, we are guilty, but all that we have done was done from necessity. You think that we attacked your brothers out of ill will, but we were driven out by our enemies, who are still at our heels. We have often asked for your Bergtmog for help, but she took no notice of us. The Magi says that if we kill half our members in fighting with each other, then the wild shepherds will come and kill all the rest. The Magi possesses great riches, but he has seen that Freya is much more powerful than all our spirits together. He will lay down his head in her lap. You are the most warlike king on the earth, and your people are of iron. Become our king, and we will be all your slaves. With glory it would be for you if you could drive back the savages. Our trumpets would resound with your praises, and the fame of your deeds would precede you everywhere. Woden was strong, fierce, and warlike, but he was not clear-sighted. Therefore he was taken in their toils and crowned by the Maggi. Very many of the sailors and soldiers to whom this proceeding was displeasing went away secretly, taking Cat with them. But Cat, who did not wish to appear before either the mother or the general assembly, jumped overboard. Then a storm arose and drove the ships upon the banks of Denmark, with the total destruction of their crews. This strait was afterwards called Kattegat. When Woden was crowned, he attacked the savages, who were all horsemen, and fell upon Woden's troops like a hailstorm. But like a whirlwind, they were turned back and did not dare to appear again. When Woden returned, Magi gave him his daughter to wife, whereupon he was incensed with herbs. But they were magic herbs, and by decrees, he became so audacious that he dared to disavow and ridicule the spirits of Freya and Ralda, while he bent his free head before the false and deceitful images. His reign lasted seven years, and then he disappeared. The Magi said that he was taken up by their gods and still reigned over us, but our people laughed at what they said. When Woden had disappeared some time, disputes arose. We wished to choose another king, but the Magi would not permit it. He asserted that it was his right given him by his idols. But besides this dispute, there was one between the Magyars and Fens, who would honor neither Freya nor Woden. The Magi did just as he pleased, because his daughter had a son by Woden and he would have it that his son was of high descent. While all were disputing and quarreling, he crowned the boy as king and set up himself as guardian and counselor. 
Those who cared more for themselves than for justice let him work his own way. But the good men took their departure. Many Magyars fled back with their troops, and the sea people took ship accompanied by a body of stalwart Finns as rowers. Next comes upon the stage the history of Nif Tiunas and Nif Inca. And we will stop there. And we'll resume next time where we left off. I appreciate you all. Please um, give like a big hug for me. Thank you. Thanks for rejoining me. We start again with our reading of the 13th century Frisian manuscript, the Orlenda. Please slap the like button on its little tushy. And here we go. All this is inscribed not only on Waraburgd, but also on Burgstavia, which lies behind the port of Stavra. When Tunis wished to return home, he went towards Denmark, but he might not land there, for so the mother had ordered, nor was he to land at Flyland, nor anywhere about there. In this way, he would have lost all his people by want and hardship. So he landed at night to steal and sailed on by day. Thus coasting along, he at length arrived at the colony of Cadic, Cadiz. So called because it was built with a stone quarry. Here they brought all kinds of stores, but Tuntia, the Bergmont, would not allow them to settle there. When they were ready, they began to disagree. Tunis wished to sail through the Straits to the Mediterranean Sea and enter the service of the rich Egyptian king, as he had done before. But Inca said he had had enough of those Fendas people. Inca thought that perchance some high-lying part of Atland might remain as an island where he and his people might live in peace. As the two cousins could not agree, Tiunas planted a red flag on the shore and Inca a blue flag. Every man could choose which he pleased, and to their astonishment the greater, greater part of the Finns and Magyars followed Inca, who had objected to serve the kings of Fenda's people. When they had counted the people and divided the ships accordingly, the fleet separated. We shall hear of Tunis afterwards, but nothing more of Inca. Neef Tunis coasted through the Straits to the Mediterranean Sea. When Atland was submerged, there was much suffering also on the shores of the Mediterranean, on which account many of Fenda's people, Krakalanders, and people of Lida's land came to us. On the other hand, many of our people went to Lida's land. The result of all this was that the Krekelanders far and wide were lost to the superintendence of the mother. Tiunas had reckoned on this, and had therefore wished to find there a good haven, from which he might go and serve under the rich princes. But as his fleet and his people had such a shattered appearance, the inhabitants on the coasts thought they were pirates and drove them away. At last they arri arrived at the Phoenician coast, 193 years after Atland was submerged. Near the coast they found an island with two deep bays, so that there appeared to be three islands. In the middle one they established themselves, and afterwards built a city wall round the place. When they wanted to give it a name, but disagreed about it, some wanted to call it Reisbergt, others Niftuna, Tunia. But the Ma Magyars and Finns begged that it may, might be called Tirhisbergt. Tir was the name of one of their idols, and it was upon his feast day that they had landed there. 
and in return they offered to recognize Tiunas as their perpetual king. Tiunas let himself be persuaded, and the others would not make any quarrel about it. When they were well established, they sent some old seamen and Magyars on an expedition as far as the town of Sidon. But at first the inhabitants of the coast would have nothing to do with them, saying, you are only foreign adventurers whom we do not respect. But when we sold them some of our iron weapons, everything went well. They also wished to buy our amber, and their inquiries about it were incessant. But Tiunas, who was far-seeing, pretended that he had no more iron weapons or amber. And then merchants came and begged him to let them have twenty vessels, which they would freight with the finest goods, and they would provide as many people to row as he would require. Twelve ships were then laden with wine, honey, tanned leather, and saddles and bridles mounted in gold, such as had never been seen before. Tunis sailed with the Flymir, with all this treasure, which so enchanted the Gravetman of the West Flyland that he induced Tunis to build a warehouse at the mouth of the Flymir. Afterwards, this place was called Amanaland, and the market where they traded at Wieringen was called Tulat Market. The mother advised that they should sell everything except iron weapons, but no attention was paid to what she said. As the Thryers had thus free play, they came from far and near to take away our goods, to the loss of our seafaring people. Therefore, it was resolved in a general assembly to allow only seven Thyrian ships and no more in a year. What the consequence of this was. In the northernmost part of the Mediterranean, there lies an island close to the coast. They now came and asked to buy that, on which a general council was held. The mother's advice was asked, and she wished to see them at some distance, so she saw no harm in it. But as we afterwards saw what a mistake we had made, we called the island Miscelia, Marseilles. Hereafter will be seen what reason we had. The Gaulin, as the missionary priests of Sidon were called, had observed that the land there was thinly peopled and was far from the mother. In order to make a favorable impression, they had themselves called in our language followers of the truth. But they had better have been called abstainers from the truth. In short, Triwinden, as our seafaring people afterwards called them. When they were well established, their merchants exchanged their beautiful copper weapons and all sorts of jewels for our iron weapons and hides of wild beasts, which were abundant in our southern countries. But the Gaulans celebrated all sorts of vile and monstrous festivals, which the inhabitants of the coast promoted with their wanton women and sweet poisonous wine. If any of our people had so conducted himself that his life was in danger, the Gaulan afforded him a refuge and sent him to Phoenicia, that is, palm land. When he was settled there, they made him write to his family, friends, and connections that the country was so good and the people so happy that no one could form any idea of it. In Britain there were plenty of men, but few women. When the Gaulan knew this, they carried off girls everywhere and gave them to the Britons for nothing. So all these gir girls served their purpose to steal children from Rualda in order to give them to false gods. We will now write about the war between the Bergmogden, Kalta, and Minerva, and how we thereby lost all our southern lands and Britain to the Gaulan. Near the southern mouth of the Rhine and the Scheldt, there are seven islands, named after Freya's seven virgins of the week. In the middle of one island is the city of Wahalagara, Middleburg. 
and on the walls of this city the following history is inscribed. Above it are the words read, learn, and watch. 563 years after the submersion of Atland, that is 1600 years before Christ, a wise town priestess presided here whose name was Minerva, called by the sailors Nihelinia. This name was well chosen for her counsels were new and clear above all others. On the other side of the Scheldt at Flyberg, Sirched presided. This maiden was full of tricks. Her face was beautiful and her tongue was nimble, but the advice that she gave was always conveyed in mysterious terms. Therefore, the mariners called her Kalta, and the landsmen thought it was a title. In the last will of the dead mother, Rosamond was named first, Minerva second, and Sirched third, in succession. Minerva did not mind that, but Sirhed was very much offended. Like a foreign princess, she wished to be honored, feared, and worshipped. But Minerva only desired to be loved. At last, all the sailors, even from Denmark and Flymere, did homage to her. This hurt Sirhed, because she wanted to excel Minerva. In order to give an impression of her great watchfulness, she had a cock put on her banner. So then Minerva went and put a sheepdog and an owl on her banner. The dog, she said, guards his master and his flock, and the owl watches that the mice shall not devastate the fields. But the cock in his lewdness and his pride is only fit to murder his nearest relations. When Kalta found that her scheme had failed, she was still more vexed. So she secretly went for the Magyars to teach her conjuring. When she had had enough of this, she threw herself into the hands of the Gauls. But all of her malpractices did not improve her position. When she saw that the sailors kept more and more aloof from her, she tried to win them back by fear. At the full moon, when the sea was stormy, she ran over the wild waves, calling to the sailors that they would all be lost if they did not worship her. Then she blinded their eyes, so that they mistook land for water, and water for land, and in this way many a good ship was totally lost. At the first war feast, when all her countrymen were armed, she brought casks of beer, which she had drugged. When they were all drunk, she mounted her war horse, leaning her head upon her spear. Sunrise could not be more beautiful. When she saw that the eyes of all were fixed upon her, she opened her lips and said, Sons and daughters of Freya, you know that in these last times we have suffered much loss and misery, because the sailors no longer come to buy our paper. But you do not know what the reason of it is. I have long kept silence about it, but can no longer do so. Listen then, my friends, and you may know on which side to show your teeth. On the other side of the Scheldt, where from time to time there come ships from all parts, they make now paper from pumpkin leaves, by which they save flax and outdo us. Now as the making of paper was always our principal industry, the mother willed that people should learn it from us. But Minerva has bewitched all the people, yes, bewitched my friends, as well as all our cattle that died lately. I must come out with it. If I were not Berktmat, I should know what to do. I should burn the witch in her nest. As soon as she uttered these words, she sped away to her citadel. But the drunken people were so excited that they did not stop to weigh what they had heard. In mad haste, they hurried over to Sandefal. And as night came on, they burst into the citadel. However, Kalta again missed her aim, for Minerva, her maidens, and her lamp were all saved by the alertness of the seamen. We will stop there. Please toss me a like. Thank you. Here we go with the Oralinda again. We're starting on part five. If you're enjoying this content or you want to support me, 
you sub, like, share, all that helps. I appreciate it greatly. We now come to the history of John. 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 Jean. Are all the same name, though the pronunciation, pronunciation varies, as the seamen like to shorten everything to be able to make it easier to call. John, that is, given, was a sea king born at Alberga, who sailed from the Flymere with a fleet of 127 ships, fitted out for a long voyage, and laden with amber, tin, copper, cloth, linen, felt, otter skins, beaver, and rabbit skins. He would have also taken paper from here, but when he saw how Calta had destroyed the citadel, he became so angry that he went off with all his people to Flyburg and out of revenge set fire to it. His admiral and some of his people saved the lamp and the maidens, but they could not catch Sergiet or Kalta. She climbed up on the furthest battlement, and they thought she must be killed in the flames, but what happened? While all her people stood transfixed with horror, she appeared upon her steed more beautiful than ever, calling to them, to Kalta. Then the other Shelda people poured out towards her. When the seamen saw that, they shouted, We are for Minerva, from which arose a war in which thousands were killed. This time, Rosamond, the mother, who had done all in her power by gentle means to preserve peace, when she saw how bad it was, made short work of it, Immediately she sent messengers through all the districts to call all the, a general levy, which brought together all the defenders of the country. The landsmen who were fighting were all caught, but John, with his seamen, took refuge on board his fleet, taking with him the two lamps, as well as Minerva and the maidens of both citadels. Helprick, the chief, summoned him to appear, but while all the soldiers were on the other side of the Scheldt, John sailed back to Flymere, and then straight to our islands. His fighting men and many of our people took women and children on board. And when John saw that he and his people would be punished for their misdeeds, he secretly took his departure. He did well for all our islanders and the other Scheldt people who had been fighting were transported to Britain. This step was a mistake, for now came the beginning of the end. Kalta, who people said could go as easily on the water as on the land, went to the mainland and on to Massilia, Marseille. Then came the Gauls out of the Mediterranean Sea with their ships to Cadiz and along all our coasts and fell upon Britain. They could not make any good footing there because the government was powerful and the exiles were still Frisians. But now came Kalta and said, you were born free and for small offenses have been sent away, not for your own improvement, but to get tin by your labor. If you wish to be free again and take my advice and live under my care, come away. I will provide you with arms and will watch over you. The news flew through the land like lightning, and before the carrier's wheel had made one revolution, she was mistress of all thryers in all our southern states as far as the Sin. She built herself a citadel on the high land to the north and called it Kaltasburg. It still exists under the name of Karanak. From this castle she ruled as a true mother, against their will, not for her followers, but over them, who were thenceforth called Celts. The Gauls gradually obtained dominion over the whole of Britain, partly because they no longer had any citadel, secondly because they had their no Burkmagden, and thirdly because they had no real lamps. 
From all these causes, the people could not learn anything. They were stupid and foolish, and having allowed the Gauls to rob them of their arms, they were led about like a bull with a ring in his nose. We shall now write how it fared with John. It is inscribed at Texland. Ten years after John went away, there arrived three ships in the Flymere. The people cried, Huzzah! What a blessing! And from their accounts, the mother had this written. When John reached the Mediterranean Sea, the reports of the Gauls had preceded him, so that on the nearest Italian coast he was nowhere safe. Therefore he went with his fleet straight over to Libya. There the black men wanted to catch them and eat them. At last they came to Tyr. But Minerva said, keep clear, for here the air has been long poisoned by the priests. The king was a descendant of Tiunus, as we were afterwards informed, but as the priests wished to have a king who, according to their ideas, was of long descent, they defied Tiunus to the vexation of his followers. <clears throat> After they had passed here, the Tyrians seized one of the rearmost ships, and as the ship was too far behind us, we could not take it back again, but John swore to be revenged for it. When night came, John bent his course towards the distant Crecolanden. At last they arrived at a country that looked very barren, but they found a harbor there. Here, said Minerva, we need not perhaps have any fears of princes or priests as they always look out for rich fat lands. When they entered the harbor, there was not room for all the ships, and yet most of the people were too cowardly to go any further. And then John, who wished to get away, went with his spear and banner, calling to the young people to know who would volunteer to share his adventures. Minerva did the same thing, but she wished to remain there. The greater part stopped with Minerva. The young sailors went with John. John took the lamp of Kalta and her maidens with him. Minerva retained her lamp and her own maidens. Between the rear and the distant coasts of Italy, John found some islands, which he thought desirable. Upon the largest, he built a city in the wood between the mountains. From the smaller islands, he made expeditions for vengeance on the Tyrians and plundered their ships and their lands. Therefore, these islands were called Insulae Piratarum, as well as Jonas Insulae. When Minerva had examined the country, which is called by its inhabitants Attica, she saw that the people were all goat herds, and that they lived on meat, wild roots, herbs, and honey. They were clothed in skins and had their dwellings on the slopes, Halinga, of the hills, wherefore they were called Halingers. At first they ran away. When they found that we did not attack them, they came back and showed great friendship. Minerva asked if we might settle there peaceably. This was agreed to on the condition that we should help them to fight against their neighbors who came continually to carry away their children and to rob their dwellings. And then we built a citadel at an hour's distance from the harbor. By the advice of Minerva, it was called Athens because, she said, those who come after us ought to know that we are not here by cunning or violence, but we received as friends, Atha. While we were building the citadel, the principal personages came to see us and when they saw that we had no slaves, it did not please them. They gave her to understand it, as they thought that she was a princess. But Minerva said, How did you get your slaves? They answered, We bought some and took others in war. Minerva replied, If nobody would buy slaves, they would not steal your children, and you would have no wars about it. If you wish to remain our allies, you will free your slaves. The chiefs did not like this and wanted to drive us away. 
that the most enlightened of the people came and helped us to build our citadel, which was built of stone. This is the history of John and of Minerva. When they had finished their story, they asked respectfully for iron weapons, for, said they, our foes are powerful, but if we have good arms, we can withstand them. When this had been agreed to, the people asked if Freya's custom would flourish in Athens and on other parts of Greece, Krakalanda. The mother answered, if the distant Greeks belong to the direct descendants of Freya, then they will flourish. But if they do not descend from Freya, then there will be a long contention about it. Because the carrier must make 5,000 revolutions of this jewel before Fenda's people will be ripe for liberty. This is about the Greek Girtmen. When Hellenia or Minerva died, the priests pretended to be with us, and in order to make it appear so, they defied Hellenia. They refused to have any other mother chosen, saying that they feared there was no one among her maidens whom they could trust as they had trusted Minerva, surnamed Nihelenia. But we could not recognize Minerva as a goddess because she herself had told us that no one could be perfectly good except the spirit of Rolda. Therefore, we choose Girt, Pyre's daughter, for our mother. When the priests saw that they could not fry their herrings on our fire, have everything their own way, they left Athens and said that we refused to acknowledge Minerva as a goddess out of envy because she had shown so much affection to the natives. Thereupon they gave the people statues of her, declaring that they might ask of them whatever they liked, as long as they were obedient to her. By these kinds of tales, the stupid people were estranged from us, and at last they attacked us. But as we had built our stone city wall with two horns down to the sea, they could not get at us. Then, lo and behold, an Egyptian high priest, bright of eye, clear of brain, and enlightened of mind, whose name was Secrops, came to give them advice. When he saw that with his people he could not storm our wall, he sent messengers to Tyr. Thereupon there arrived three hundred ships full of wild mountain soldiers, which sailed unexpectedly into our haven while we were defending our walls. When they had taken our harbor, the wild soldiers wanted to plunder the village and our ships. One had already ravished a girl, but Secrops would not permit it, and the Tyrian sailors, who still had Frisian blood in their veins, said, If you do that, we will burn our ships, and you shall never see your mountains again. Secrops, who had no inclination towards murder or devastation, sent messengers to Girt. Requiring her, requiring her to give up the citadel, offering her free exit with all her live and dead property, and her followers the same. The wisest of the citizens, seeing that they could not hold the citadel, advised Geert to accept at once, before Cecrops became furious and changed his mind. Three months afterwards, Geert departed with the best of Freya's sons and seven times twelve ships, Soon after they had left the harbor, they fell in with at least 30 ships coming from Tyre, with women and children. They were on their way to Athens, but when they heard how things stood there, they went with Girt. The sea king of the Tyrians brought them all together through the strait, which at the time ran into the Red Sea, and now reestablished as the Suez Canal. At last they landed at the Punjab, called in our language the Five Rivers, because five rivers flow together to the sea. Here they settled and called it Girtmania. The king of Tyre afterwards, seeing that all his best sailors were gone, sent all his ships with his wild soldiers to catch them dead or alive. When they arrived at the strait, both the sea and the earth trembled.
The land was upheaved so that all the water ran out of the strait, and the muddy shores were raised up like a rampart. This happened on account of the virtu virtues of the Girtman, as everyone can plainly understand. In the year 1005, after Atland was submerged, this was inscribed on the eastern wall of Freiesburg. After twelve years had elapsed without our seeing any Italians in Almond, there came three ships, finer than any that we possessed or had ever seen. On the largest of them was a king of the Jonshin Islands, whose name was Ulysses, the fame of whose wisdom was great. To him a priestess had prophesied that he should become king of all Italy, provided he could obtain a lamp that had been lighted at the lamp in Texland. For this purpose, he had brought great treasures with him, above all, jewels for women more beautiful than had ever been seen before. They were from Troy, a town that the Greeks had taken. All these treasures he could offer to the mother, but the mother would have nothing to do with them. At last, when he found that there was nothing to be got from her, he went to Wahalagara, Walk Charon. There, there was established a Burkmogd, whose name was Kat, but who's commonly called Kala, because her lower lip stuck out like a masthead. Here he tarried for years, to the scandal of all who, that knew it. According to the report of the maidens, he obtained a lamp from her, but it did him no good, because when he got to sea, his ship was lost, and he was taken up naked and destitute by another ship. There was left behind <clears throat> this king, a writer of pure Phrias blood, born in the new harbor of Athens, who wrote for us what follows about Athens, from which may be seen how truly the mother Helic spoke when she said that the customs of Phraia could never take firm hold in Athens. From the other Greeks, you will have heard a great deal of bad about Cecrops, because he was not in good repute. But I dare affirm that he was an enlightened man, very renowned both among the inhabitants and among us, for he was against oppression, unlike the other priests, was virtuous, and knew how to value the wisdom of distant nations. Knowing that, he permitted us to live according to our own Eskebok. There was a story current that he was favorable to us because he was the son of a Frisian girl and an Egyptian priest. The reason of this was that he had blue eyes and that many of our girls had been stolen and sold to Egypt. But he never confirmed this. However it may have been, certain it is that he showed us more friendship than all the other priests together. When he died, his successor soon began to tear up our charters and gradually to enact so many unsuitable statutes that at long last nothing remained of liberty but the shadow and the name. Besides, they would not allow the laws to be written so that the knowledge of them was hidden from us. Formerly, all the cases in Athens were pleaded in our language, but afterwards in both languages, and at last in the native language only. At first, the men of Athens only married women of our own race, but the young men, as they grew up with the girls of the country, took them to wife. The bastard children of this connection were the handsomest and cleverest in the world, but they were likewise the wickedest, wavering between the two parties, paying no regard to laws or customs, except where they suited their own interests. As long as a ray of Freya's spirit existed, all the building materials were for common use, and no one might build a house larger or better than his neighbors. But when some degenerate townspeople got rich by sea voyages and by the silver that their slaves got in the silver countries, they went out to live on the hills or in the valleys, 
were behind high enclosures of trees or walls. They built palaces with costly furniture. And in order to remain in good odeur with the nasty priests, they placed their likenesses of false gods and unchaste statues. Sometimes the dirty priests and princes wished for the boys rather than the girls and often led them astray from the paths of virtue by rich presidents, presents, or by force. Because riches were more valued by this lost and degenerate race than virtue or honor. One sometimes saw boys dressed in splendid flowing robes to the disgrace of their parents and maidens and to the shame of their own sex. If our simple parents came to general assembly at Athens and made compl complaints, a cry was raised, Hear, hear, there is a sea monster going to speak. Such is Athens become, like a morass in a tropical country full of leeches, toads, and poisonous snakes, in which no man of descent habits can set decent habits can set his foot. <clears throat> This is inscribed in all our citadels. How our Denmark was lost to us 1,602 years after the submersion of Atland. Through the mad wantonness of Woden, Maggi had become master of the east part of Scandinavia. They dare not come over the hills and over the sea. The mother would not prevent it, she said. I see no danger in their weapons, but much in taking the Scandinavians back again, because they are so degenerate and spoilt. The General Assembly were of the same opinion, therefore it was left to him. A good hundred years ago, Denmark began to trade. They gave their iron weapons in exchange for gold ornaments, as well as for copper and iron ore. The mother sent messengers to advise them to have nothing to do with this trade. There was danger to their morals in it, and if they lost their morals, they would soon lose their liberty. But the Denmarkers paid no attention to her. They did not believe that they could lose their morals, therefore they would not listen to her. At last, they were at a loss themselves for weapons and necessaries. And this difficulty was their punishment. Their bodies were brilliantly adorned, but their cupboards and their sheds were empty. Just 100 years after the first ship with provisions sailed from the coast, poverty and want made their appearance. Hunger spread her wings all over the country. Dissension marched proudly about the streets and into the houses. Charity found no place in unity departed. The child asked its mother for food. She had no food to give, only jewels. The women applied to their husbands. The husbands appealed to the courts. The courts had nothing to give, or if they had, they hid it away. Now the jewels must be sold. But while the sailors were away for that purpose, the frost came and laid a plank upon the sea and the strait of the sound. When the frost had made the bridge, vigilance ceased in the land, and treachery took its place. Instead of watching on the shores, they put their horses in their sledges and drove off to Scandinavia. And then the Scandinavians, who hungered after the land of their forefathers, came to Denmark. One bright night, they all came. Now, they said, we have a right to the land of our forefathers. And while they were fighting about it, the Fens came to the defenseless villages and ran away with the children. As they had no good weapons, they lost the battle, and with it, their freedom. And Maggie became master. All this was the consequence of their not reading Freya's texts and neglecting her counsels. There are some who think that they were betrayed by the counts and that the maidens had long suspected it. But if anyone attempted to speak about it, his mouth was shut by golden chains. We can express no opinion about it. We can only say to you, do not trust too much to the wisdom of your princes 
or of your maidens. But if you wish to keep things straight, everybody must watch over his own passions, as well as the general welfare. Two years afterwards, Maggie himself came with a fleet of light boats to steal the lamp from the mother of Texan. This wicked deed he accomplished one stormy winter night, while the wind roared and the hail rattled against the windows. The watchman on the tower, hearing the noise, lighted his torch. As soon as the light from the tower fell upon the bastion, he saw that already armed men had got over the wall. He immediately gave the alarm, but it was too late. Before the guard was ready, there were 2,000 people battering the gate. The struggle did not last long, as the guards had not kept good watch. They were overwhelmed. While the fight was going on, a rascally Finn stole into the chamber of the mother and would have done her violence. She resisted him and threw him down against the wall. When he got up, he ran his sword through her. If you will not have me, you shall have my sword. A Danish soldier came behind him and cleaved his head in two. There came from it a streak of black blood and a wreath of blue flame. When Maggie had the mother nursed on his own ship, as soon as she was well enough to speak clearly, the Maggie told her that she must sail with him, but that she should keep her lamp and her maidens and should hold a station higher than she had ever done before. Moreover, he said that he should ask her, in presence of all his chief men, if she would become the ruler of all the country and people of Freya, that she must declare and affirm this, or he would let her die a painful death. Then, when he gathered all his chiefs around her bed, he asked in a loud voice, Frana, since you are a prophetess, shall I become ruler over all the lands of and people of Freya? Frana did as if she took no notice of him, but at last she opened her lips and said, My eyes are dim, but the other light dawns upon my soul. Yes, I see it. I hear Ertha and rejoice with me. At the time of the submersion of Atlan, the first spoke of the jewel stood at the top. After that it went down, and our freedom with it. When two spokes of two thousand years shall have rolled down, the suns shall arise, who have been bred of the fornication of the princes and priests with the people, and shall witness against their fathers. They shall all fall by murder but what they have proclaimed shall endure and shall bear fruit in the bosom of able men, like good seed which is laid upon thy lap. Yet a thousand years shall the sp spoke descend and sink deeper in the darkness and in the bloodshed over you by the wickedness of the princes and priests. After that, the dawn shall bring begin to glow when they perceive this, the false princes and priests will strive and wrestle against freedom. But freedom, love, and unity will take the people under their protection and rise out of the vile pool. The light which at first only glimmered shall gradually become a flame. The blood of the bad shall flow over your surface, but you must not absorb it. At last, the poisoned animals shall eat and die of it. All the stories that have been written in praise of the princes and priests shall be committed to the flames. Thenceforth, your children shall live in peace. When she had finished speaking, she sank down. The Maggie, who had not understood her, shrieked out, I have asked you if I should become master of all the lands and people of Freya, and now you have been speaking to another. Frana raised herself up, stared at him, and said, Before seven days have passed, your soul shall haunt the tombs with the night birds, and your body shall be at the bottom of the sea. Very good.
<clears throat> said the Maggie, swelling with rage. Say that I am coming. Then he said to his executioners, throw this woman overboard. This was the end of the last of the mothers. We do not ask for revenge. Time will provide that. But a thousand, thousand times we will call with Freya, watch, watch, watch. That's all for tonight. I will see you next time. Please don't forget to click like. Postscript. When the sailors were in the creek, there was a wag from Stavoran among them, who said Medea may well laugh if we rescue her from her Sylvia. Upon this, the maidens gave to the creek the name Medea, Melelakia, Lake of Medea. The occurrences that happened after this, everybody can remember. The maidens are too related in their own way and have it well inscribed. We consider that our task is fulfilled. Hail, the end of the book. The writings of Aldo Brast and Apollonia. My name is Aldo Brast, the son of Apoll and Adela. I was elected by the people as Gravetman over Lindum Orden. Therefore, I will continue this book in the same way as my mother has spoken it. After the Maggie was killed in Freiesburg, was restored, a mother had to be chosen. The mother had not named her successor, and her will was nowhere to be found. Seven months later, in General Assembly, was called at Granega, Groningen, because it was on the boundary of Saxe-Marken. My mother was chosen, but she would not be the mother. She had saved my father's life, in consequence of which they had fallen in love with each other. And she wished to marry. Many people wished my mother to alter her decision, but she said an era mother ought to be as pure in her conscience as she appears outwardly, and to have the same love for all her children. Now, as I appall, better than anything else in this world, I cannot be such a mother. Thus spoke and reasoned Adela, and all the other maidens wished her to be the mother. Each state was in favor of its own maiden, and would not yield, therefore none was chosen, and the kingdom was without any restraint. From what follows you will understand Lugert, the king, who had lately, lately died, had been chosen in the lifetime of the mother and seemingly with the love and confidence of all the states. It was his turn to live at the great court of Dokem, and in the lifetime of the mother, great humor was done to him there, as there were more messengers and knights there than had ever been seen there before. But now he was lonely and forsaken, because everyone was afraid that he would set himself above the law and rule them like the slave kings. Every headman imagined that he did enough if he looked after his own state and did not care for the others. With the Baruch Martin, it was still worse. Each of them depended upon her own judgment, and whenever a gravetman did anything without her, she raised distrust between him and his people. If any case happened which concerned several states, and one maid had been consulted, and the rest all exclaimed that she had spoken only in the interest of her own state. And by such proceedings, they brought disputes among the states, and so severed the bond of union, that the people of one state were jealous of those of the rest, or at least considered them as strangers. The consequence of which was that the Gauls and the Truind and Druids took possession of our lands as far as the Scheldt, and the Maggie, as far as Wasara. How this happened, my mother has explained, otherwise this book would not have been written. Although I have lost all hope that it would be of any use, do not write in the hope that I shall win back the land or preserve it. In my opinion, that is impossible. I write only for the future generations, that they may all know in what way we were lost, and that each may learn that every crime brings its punishment. My name is Apollonia. 
22 and 30 days after my mother's death, my brother Adelbrost was found murdered on the wharf, his skull fractured and his limbs torn asunder. My father, who lay ill, died of fright. And then my younger brother, Apol, sailed from here to the west side of Schumland. There he built a citadel named Lindesberg in order there to avenge our wrong. Waraldo accorded him many years for that. He had five sons who all caused fear to Maggie and brought fame to my brother. After the death of my mother and my brother, all the bravest of the land joined together and made a covenant called Adelbond. In order to preserve us from injury, they brought me and my youngest brother, Adelhurt, to the Burkt, me to the maidens, and him to the warriors. When I was 30 years old, I was chosen as Burgmod, and my brother at 50 was chosen Gravetman. From my mother's side, my brother was the sixth, but from my father's side, the third. By right, therefore, his descendants could not put Uvra Linda after their names, but they all wished to do it in honor of their mother. In addition to this, there was given to us also a copy of the Book of Adela's Flowers that gave me the most pleasure because it came into the world by my mother's wisdom. In the Burkt, I have found other writings also in praise of my mother. All this I will write afterwards. These are the writings left by Bruno, who was the writer of this Burkt, after the followers of Adela had made copies, each in his kingdom, of what was inscribed upon the walls of the Burkt. They resolved to choose a mother. For this purpose, a general assembly was called at this farm. By the first advice of Adela, Tio Yint was recommended. That would have been arranged only by my Magd as to speak. She had always supposed that she would be chosen mother because she was at the birth from which mothers had generally been chosen. When she was allowed to speak, she opened her false lips and said, you all seem to place great value on Adela's advice, but that shall not shut my mouth. Who is Adelia, Adela, and whence comes it that you respect her so highly? She was what I am now, a Bergdmod of this place. Is she then wiser and better than I and all the others? Or is she more conversant with our laws and customs? If that had been the case, she would have become mother when she was chosen. But instead of that, she preferred matrimony to a single life, watching over herself and her people. She is certainly very clear-sighted, but my eyes are far from being dim. I have observed that she is very much attached to her husband, which is very praiseworthy, but I see likewise that Tiunt is a Paul's niece. Further, I say nothing. The principal people understood very well which way the wind blew with her, but among the people there arose disputes, and as most of the people came from here, I would not give the honor to Tiunt. The conferences were ended, knives were drawn, and no mother was chosen. Shortly afterwards, one of our messengers killed his comrade. As he had been a man of good character hitherto, my Bergdmad had permission to help him over the frontier. But instead of helping him over to Twixland, Germany, she fled with him herself to Wisara, and then to the Magi. The Magi, who wished to please his sons of Raya, appointed her mother of Godeberg in Schoenland. But she wished for more, and she told him that if he could get Adela out of the way, he might become master of the whole of Raya's land. She said she hated Adela for having prevented her from being chosen mother. If he would promise her Texland, her messenger would serve as a guide to his warriors. All this was confessed confessed by her messenger. The second writing, 15 months after the last general assembly, at the festival of, festival of har harvest month, everybody gave himself up to pleasure and merrymaking. No one thought of anything but diversion. But Waralda wished to teach us that watchfulness should never be relaxed. In the midst of the festivities, the fog came. 
and enveloped every place in darkness. Cheerfulness melted away, but watchfulness did not take its place. The Coast Guard deserted their beacons, and no one was to be seen on any of the paths. When the fog rose, the sun scarcely appeared among the clouds, but the people all came out shouting with joy. And the young folks went about singing with, to their bagpipes, filling the air with their melody. But while everyone was intoxicated with pleasure, treachery had landed with its horses and riders. As usual, darkness had favored the wicked, and they had slipped in through the paths of Linda's wood. Before Adela's door, twelve girls led twelve lambs, and twelve boys led twelve calves. A young Saxon bestrode a wild bull which he had caught and tamed. They were decked with all kinds of flowers and the girls' dresses were fringed with gold from the Rhine. When Adela came out of her house, a shower of flowers fell on her head. They all cheered loudly, and the fifes of the boys were heard over everything. Poor Adela, poor people, how short will will be your joy? When the procession was out of sight, a troop of Magyar soldiers rushed up to Adela's house. Her father and her husband were sitting on the steps. The door was open, and within stood Adelbrost, her son. When he saw the danger of his parents, he took his bow from the wall and shot the leader of the pirates, who staggered and fell on the grass. The second and third met a similar fate. In the meantime, his parents had seized their weapons and went slowly to John's house. They would soon have been taken, but Adela came. She had learned in the burg to use all kinds of weapons. She was seven feet high, and her sword was the same length. She waved it three times over her head, and each time a knight bit the earth. Reinforcements came, and the pirates were made prisoners. But too late, an arrow had penetrated her bosom. Treacherous Maggie had poisoned it, and she died of it. The Elegy of the Burg Magd Yes, departed friend, thousands are arrived, more are coming, and they wish to hear the wisdom, wisdom of Adela. Truly, she was a princess, for she had always been the leader. Oh, sorrow, what good can you do? Her garments of linen and wool she spun and wove herself. How could she add to her beauty? Not with pearls, for her teeth were more white. Not with gold, for her tresses were more brilliant. Not with precious stones, for her eyes, though soft as those of a lamb, were so lustrous that you could scarcely look into them. But why do I talk of beauty? Freya was certainly not more beautiful. Yes, my friends, Freya, who possessed seven perfections, of which each of her daughters inherited one, or at most three. But even if she had been ugly, she was still would have been dear to us. Is she warlike? Listen, my friend, Adela was the only daughter of our Gravetman. She stood seven feet high. Her wisdom exceeded her stature, and her courage was equal to both together. Here is an instance. There was once a turf ground on fire. Three children got upon yonder gravestone. There was a furious wind, the people were all shouting, and the mother was helpless. Then came Adela. What are you all standing still for, she cried. Try to help them, and Waraldo will give you strength. And then she ran to the Crailwood and got some elder branches, to which she made a bridge, and others came to assist her, and the children were saved. The children bring flowers to the place every year. There came once three Phoenician sailors who began to ill-treat the children. When Adela, having heard their screams, beat the scoundrels till they were insensible, and then, to prove to them what miserable wretches they were, she tied them all, three, to a spindle. The foreign lords came to look after their people, and when they saw how ridiculously they had been treated, they were very angry, till they were told what had happened. Upon that they bowed themselves before Adela, and kissed the hem of her garment. But come distant, living friend, the birds of the forest fled before the numerous visitors. Come, friend, and you shall hear her wisdom. By the gravestone of which mention has already been made, her body is buried. 
upon the stone the following words are inscribed. Tread softly, for here lies Adela. The old legend which is written on the outside wall of the city tower is not written in the book of Adela's flowers. Why this has been neglected I do not know, but this book is my own, so I shall put it in out of regard to my relations. The Oldest Doctrine Hail to all the well-intentioned children of Freya. Through them the earth shall become holy. Learn and announce to the people, Waralda is the Ancient of Ancients, and he created all things. Waralda is all in all, for he is eternal and everlasting. Waralda is omnipresent, but invisible, and therefore is called a spirit. All that we can see of him are the created beings who come to life through him and go again because from Ruralda all things proceed and return to him. Ruralda is the beginning and the end. Ruralda is the only almighty being, because from him all other strength comes and returns to him. Therefore he alone is the creator, and nothing exists without him. Ruralda established eternal principles upon which the laws of creation were founded. No good laws could stand on any other foundation. But although everything is derived from Ralda, the wickedness of men does not come from him. Wickedness comes from heaviness, carelessness, and stupidity. Therefore, they may well be injurious to men, but never to Ralda. Ralda is wisdom, and the laws that he has made are the books from which we learn. Nor is any wisdom to be found or gathered but in them. Men may see a great deal, but Waralda sees everything. Men can learn a great deal, but Waralda knows everything. Men can discover much, but to Waralda everything is open. Mankind are male and female, but Waralda created both. Mankind love and hate, but Waralda alone is just. Therefore, Waralda is good, and there is no good without him. In the progress of time, all creation alters and changes, but goodness alone is unalterable, and since Waralda is good, he cannot change. As he endures, he alone exists, everything else is show.